I'm Dr. Tamer Yalsinkaya. I'm the founder and medical director of Carolina's Fertility Institute. We have created these video series in order to better educate our patients about IVF and to make them more comfortable during the process of in vitro fertilization. Let's start off with indications for in vitro fertilization and then we will move on to uh, what happens in the embryology laboratory and finally we will talk about ancillary procedures such as embryo freezing and embryo biopsy in certain cases and then we will finish it off with uh, a discussion of uh, risks and complications of in vitro fertilization just as they are outlined in the IVF consent form that you have already received or will receive before you start the in vitro fertilization process. First of all, when is in vitro fertilization needed? Uh, what are the indications? In vitro fertilization was uh, invented for uh, patients who have no tubes or have a tubal damage, but it soon became evident that patients who have other problems such as problem with male sperm or endometriosis or uh, ovulation problem as well as immunologic infertility uh, can also be helped when simpler treatments fail to help them get pregnant. There is such a thing as unexplained infertility it's not a reason for despair. Um, unexplained infertility means uh, by the available tests currently, we cannot find a real cause for the couple's infertility. So all of these treatments, except for ovarian aging, actually offers the same chances of success following in vitro fertilization. So in a way, IVF levels the playing field for all these indications. There is one problem uh, in the case of ovarian aging is that depending on how much ovarian aging has occurred in a patient over 35 or in a patient over 40, the success chances of IVF will drop accordingly and uh, different types of tests are used, blood tests, to determine this and a separate discussion is uh, carried out with the couple in these cases. These are the phases of in vitro fertilization. We start off by stimulating the ovaries with FSH or follicle stimulating hormone injections. Ultrasound and hormone monitoring is performed during this 10 to 12 day period, followed by an egg retrieval or oocyte retrieval. And then the embryos and uh, de develop in our embryology laboratory at CFI following incubation with the sperm and then embryos are transferred and supernumerary embryos, the leftovers, are available for cryopreservation or freezing. So let me take you through this complex looking slide this is a timetable for stimulation of ovaries for most of our patients and they, it starts off by um, a drug called Lupron or nasal form of Lupron called Cinerel and we administer this drug for the 10 days prior to the onset of the menstrual cycle which will also start the IVF treatment. So most of our patients know when their periods are going to start and we start the uh, Cinerel nasal spray or Lupron about seven to ten days before their period starts. If the patient has irregular periods then it is customary, it's quite common, we will put them on uh, hormonal pills like birth control pills so that they have a predictable start date for that period. So shown here in light blue are the main stay of their treatment FSH injections and you will usually take this for anywhere from 8 to 11 days 
and at the end of which will come the most important ACG trigger injection shown here in red. During this 8 to 10 days of uh, FSH injection period, you will have three to four transvaginal ultrasound exams either done by us or if you are from out of town by your local OBGYN or ultrasound clinic which would be then faxed to us for us to give you injection dosage instructions the same evening. So shown here are the menstrual cycle days of the IVF cycle, 1 through 11, 12, and uh, the HCG injection is most important because it helps mature the oocytes, the eggs, such that they can be easily retrieved or harvested at the time of egg retrieval, and they can also be mature for fertilization by the sperm. So the um, after a three or four ultrasound exams over a period of 10 to 11 days, the eggs or the follicles containing the eggs will be considered of a mature size and your hormone levels of estradiol will indicate that the lining has been prepared adequately and we will decide on the HCG trigger. At that point, we will give you an exact time for your HCG injection and um, you will come back to our Winston-Salem office where the IVF laboratory and the procedure f uh, room are located for an egg retrieval under anesthesia. So one thing we can reassure you about the procedure is that when it's done under modified anesthesia care, which is an intravenous form of propofol plus local anesthetic, you will not feel any significant discomfort through this whole procedure. In fact, you will not remember any of this 30 to 45 minute procedure. Prior to the procedure, you will meet with the nurse who will start your IV and will give you IV antibiotics to lower the risk of a pelvic infection type complication, which is very rare. And then as you see on the slide, the transvaginal probe with a needle guide will take on a needle connected to a tube, and this will be inserted through the back wall of the vagina such that the ovary, which is standing right behind the vaginal skin in its enlarged form will be accessible and will be entered and you will not feel any of this discomfort. And as you see in this magnified view, because you have taken the ACG trigger properly, the mature egg will simply drift into the needle and be collected in the, in the test tube and will be passed on to our human embryology laboratory next door and immediate feedback will be given to, to the doctor that the egg has been found or not found. So this procedure takes about 20 to 40 minutes depending on how many eggs your ovaries have made and then you will uh, recover for 10 to 15 minutes and you'll be able to go home. Uh, you'll, take, you'll be able to take a ride back home. And during your rest period, your partner uh, will be collecting a semen sample, and this will be analyzed, and the fast-swimming sperm will be purified and taken through what we call a capacitation step, and will be ready for insemination of the eggs. I will talk to you a little bit now about what goes on behind the closed doors of the embryology lab, although we do actually have a very large uh, window through which our patients and their spouses can watch the activities of our embryology staff, which 
is a unique aspect of our program. Uh, one of the things that are exciting to us and that uh, gives us a source of pr pride is some of the most uh, re uh, recent and uh, highest technology uh, IVF uh, facilities that we uh, have equipped our laboratory with. One of them is the embryoscope. It is a time-lapse system incorporated into a incubator such that the embryos after the eggs are inseminated with the sperm no longer need to be taken out, brought to the microscope, altering their uh, gas mixture in the incubator, altering the temperature, all of which the embryos are very sensitive to. And uh, instead, embryoscope allows the uh, embryo dishes to go under a built-in microscope which is connected to a video camera and every 20 minutes their photographs are taken and the embryologist or the medical director or the reproductive endocrinologist taking care of the patient can remotely uh, monitor this without ever opening the lid of the incubator and by published research uh, this system has increased the uh, success rate of IVF by 20% or more and we have certainly um, experienced this in the early phase of our uh, operation at Carolina's Fertility Institute. So uh, the other th feature of this system is that by uh, analyzing intervals between certain cell divisions within each embryo the embryoscope uses its built-in algorithms and selects or determines which embryo is most likely to be chromosomally normal and therefore will most likely to implant. And it allows us to transfer very few embryos, usually one in women under 35, uh, to allow the maximum chances of success without increasing the risk of twins or triplets. Here you're seeing um, Dr. Holoji Gilar, embryologist, examining remotely the blastocyst development of one of our patients and uh, rewinding the past five days of the uh, journey that this embryo has taken without, again, ever opening the lid of the incubator. The other advance in ART laboratory that we availed ourselves of is the Life Air air purification system, which removes a uh, hundredfold uh, better the volatile organic chemicals that are so detrimental to embryo growth and again, we uh, consider this a major improvement and major contributor to the uh, great improvement in our success rates in our program. So going back to what happens with the tube of ovarian fluid that we immediately pass down to the embryologist, the embryologist finds the egg, as you see on this picture, um, in a heap of uh, ovarian cells and the, so that we can uh, cause it out so that we can move on to the next set of uh, follicles in the patient. And ordinarily uh, the uh, conventional incubators look something like this and again we're not using this uh, anymore because of the advantage of having the embryoscope in our laboratory. But a conventional embryo incubator looks something like this where different shelves are dedicated to different patients' embryos and as you see when you open the door or uh, to this incubator you can imagine the perturbations in temperature and the gas mixture around the embryos. So um, after the egg retrieval, the uh, partner will do his part and give a sperm sample uh, in our facility or 
in certain circumstances, we allow him to bring it with him to the procedure within an hour. In this case, if the sperm parameters are normal, we will achieve fertilization by what we call uh, micro drop insemination, conventional insemination, where we add about 100,000 motile sperm to the uh, uh, dish with the eggs in it. Um, a question that comes up when we are uh, seen to be taking care of multiple patients and their uh, eggs and their husband's sperm is how do we know the right sperm will get to the right egg? Well, we take extreme precautions as we are required to uh, by law and professional standards uh, to double label everything and have a witness in the laboratory when critical steps are being taken such as the sperm is being added to the partner's eggs or the sperm is being injected into the partner's uh, eggs and, uh, and are extremely sensitive to, uh, to uh, prevent any kind of mix-ups or uh, uncertainties. If the husband's semen has poor parameters such as sperm concentration below normal or motility below normal or uh, normally shaped sperm are uh, very few, then we recommend ICSI or intracytoplasmic sperm injection. And in our program, we also use a modification of ICSI called IMSI or intracytoplasmic morphologically selected sperm injection where we magnify the sperm 65 times higher magnification and select morphologically normal sperm that don't carry any uh, cytoplasmic droplets. These are blemishes that make it more likely for the sperm not to fertilize well or not to uh, result in an ongoing pregnancy. And by using IMSI method, studies have found lower miscarriage risk and higher ongoing pregnancy rates uh, in IVF cycles. So the whether it's MC selected or just uh, lower magnification selected sperm, the goal of uh, uh, <coughs> micro injection of sperm is to inject a single sperm into a mature egg. Here, you're seeing a video clip of an egg stabilized by a large holding pipette surrounded by uh, the egg shell, or we call this zona pellucida, and here the ICSI needle is loaded with a selected sperm and it's about to pierce through the zona pellucida and cross the uh, little gap we call perivitelline space and then puncture the actual egg itself and then deposit the uh, prepared sperm into the egg and this procedure has uh, increased fertilization rates in cases of desperately low sperm counts or sperm quality to almost 90, 95% and resulted in healthy babies being born. So here is the procedure and notice that the ooplasm or the egg itself is ru almost rubbery so the embryologist is actually making sure he or she pierced the egg by drawing some of the cytoplasm in and then here it is the sperm is being deposited into cytoplasm of the egg and then the egg is um, uh, placed in the incubator and the next egg is ready for sperm injection or micro injection. So uh, we incubate the embryos for five days, uh, up to six days, and during this process, the fertilized egg goes through several cell divisions. It becomes a pronuclear embryo the next day, and then it becomes a two to four cell embryo the following day, which is day two, and six to eight cell embryo on day three. On day four, it goes through a uh, appearance we call morula or mulberry type appearance of many small cells that are fused together. And finally, on day five, it becomes a blastocyst 
which is a, a ball of cells with a fluid filled internal cavity and this um, internal uh, heap of cells is what we call inner cell mass and that's what makes the fetus and the surrounding rim of cells is trophectoderm what we, uh, which will make the placenta and as you see it still is contained in the original egg shell that the egg came in but it's much thinner and eventually the embryo will actually um, enzymatically make a little hole and ooze out of this eggshell and will try to attach the endometrium if we transfer that embryo. In fact, in our program, we perform assisted zona hatching on the eggshell before transferring such embryos because um, uh, in some cases, of embryo implantation may be impeded by very hard shell of the egg by very hardened uh, zona and we find that we found that the laser uh, hatching in a in a way to assist the embryo can increase embryo implantation chances now by saying these things i've implied that we transfer the embryos routinely on day 5 and sometimes day 6 of the embryos that's based on our observations that that's the best day to transfer embryos to give the patient a realistic um, chance that pregnancy will occur. So a lot of you who have been on uh, internet or uh, talked to, uh, visited other websites or other IVF programs may have heard of day three transfer. Um, and here uh, I will review the benefits of waiting till day five. We can select a good quality embryo better by uh, waiting till day five because um, those embryos that are chromosomally not normal or have quality problems will arrest their development along the way between days zero and day five. And transferring embryos that we're gonna arrest only gives the patient false hopes and um, they will experience a negative pregnancy test, unfortunately, if such embryos were transferred. Whereas waiting till day five increases chances, although it, doesn't, it does not guarantee it, but it increases the chances that the transferred embryo will have a high chance of implanting and producing a pregnancy. So after the egg retrieval procedure, um, you'll be able to go home and the next day you can do your normal activities. There are certain medications such as starting methylprednisolone and continuing your baby aspirin and uh, finishing any antibiotics that you will be specifically instructed to do. Two days after egg retrieval, you will start taking progesterone in oil. And in some cases, we are okay with the patient using a vaginal cream of progesterone if she is averse to intramuscular injections of um, progesterone and we will give you pretty much daily progress reports on your embryos and finally on day five uh, you will come in for embryo transfer and for those of you who are nervous about uh, going through a procedure uh, that is similar to doing a pap smear or for those of you who had insemination similar to insemination we're happy to prescribe you some um, Valium or some other uh, nerve relaxing pill, but you will come uh, at your appointment time for a uh, with a full bladder, and we have specific instructions on how to fill the bladder so that we can uh, see the procedure of embryo transfer with a trans abdominal ultrasound exam, and uh, without requiring any other further anesthesia or numbing. Um, we will uh, have you get situated in gynecologic exam position in the procedure room right next to our embryology lab. And your uh, partner, your spouse can accompany you and sit next to you during this procedure. Um, and we will uh, transfer one or two embryos typically um, inside the droplet that this catheter will 
carry by passing it very carefully and slowly into a certain spot in the uterine cavity and monitoring this with a transabdominal ultrasound and the whole procedure will take 10-15 minutes and after that you'll be resting on the uh, ta uh, exam table for 15 minutes or so after which you'll be able to use the bathroom, empty your bladder and then go home uh, to, for modified rest which means no strenuous uh, activity, no house cleaning or furniture moving, but uh, it doesn't have to be an absolute bed rest as uh, many patients still envision. Uh, it can be a modified rest. Uh, then we will do a pregnancy test in eight days in your local lab if you're from out of town and then arrange an ultrasound uh, hoping that, uh, assuming that it worked, uh, seven to ten days later and then refer you to your OB after confirming heart activity during the second ultrasound which takes place after the first ultrasound, two weeks after the first ultrasound. So now I will talk to you about some ancillary procedures. One of them is uh, embryo freezing um, or cryopreservation and we would very much like to to freeze or cryopreserve your extra embryos in case you want to have another baby or in case the first cycle doesn't work or ends up with a miscarriage. And in this case, um, we take them through a new method of freezing called vitrification method where uh, the embryos are treated with some antifreeze type solution and then rapidly cooled in liquid nitrogen allowing um, the embryo to take on a vitreous glass-like structure and preventing water from freezing and forming crystals which would be harmful and shatter the cells of the embryos. And then uh, after such uh, vitrification the embryos are kept in liquid nitrogen um, at 320 one degree Fahrenheit uh, for many years, uh, if not indefinitely. The new method of vitrification has uh, ensured that the frozen thawed embryos, if it's done in expert skilled hands, uh, is fully intact upon thawing and upon um, uh, we call it warming of such vitrified embryos. And this has again leveled the playing field uh, uh, and maybe even will, and uh, future studies will show that it will improve uh, the success rate because s uh, newer studies are already showing that um, freezing embryos in this manner and then thawing them uh, in a rather simple uh, endometrial preparation cycle may be associated with higher uh, pregnancy rates and better outcomes than placing the fresh embryo into the uh, endometrium that has seen all the fluctuations of estrogen hormone to uh, levels above normal physiology. And more to come on this as research um, uh, and experience is accumulated, but uh, we are certainly comfortable with freezing the uh, extra embryos at this point. And this actually requires uh, uh, certain provisions to be made, such as a contract to be signed uh, between the couple and us, but also between the partners, because um, you can imagine all kinds of custody battles in case the marriage breaks up or in case, um, uh, or other issues such as uh, so-called abandoned embryos, if the IVF clinic were to never hear from the couple despite certified letters and so on, um, and the clinic happens to be holding their embryos. So all these um, points are covered when we're uh, about to freeze a couple's uh, or a patient's embryos uh, so that everybody's on the same page. Now, more and more, um, 
genetic makeup or chromosomal normalcy of the embryo is um, being tested in IVF clinics, including ours. And currently, 30 to 40 percent of the uh, couples in our program, where the uh, a woman is over 35, are requesting uh, embryo biopsy and pre-implantation genetic screening to prevent, number one, um, miscarriages and to prevent time lost due to a miscarriage, but also um, to um, allow us to transfer a single embryo even in a patient who's 39, 40, 42 years old, while uh, optimizing their chances of a normal pregnancy and also eliminating trisomy 21 or Down syndrome type um, lethal conditions or conditions that are associated with very uh, uh, low life expectancy in the, in the uh, newborn. Um, in addition, this ability to take a few cells from the embryo and uh, allows us to test for cases of certain genetic conditions such as cystic fibrosis, sickle cell, Tay-Sachs disease, and numerous other conditions if and only if we know and have predetermined that the couple is at risk for that. But the same technique is used. We simply um, make a, uh, etch a hole with laser on day five or day six blastocyst stage embryo and take four to five cells out and freeze the rest of the embryo until the sample is sent to a certified genetics laboratory via courier and until the results come back to us. And because of the time this takes, such embryos are best frozen upon biopsy and then the patient receives one normal embryo or maximum two during a frozen embryo thaw cycle ensuring best possible outcomes. This concludes the outline of what an IVF uh, process con uh, consists of, including the ancillary procedures of embryo freezing and, um, and also embryo biopsy and pre-implantation genetic testing. Next, I will briefly talk to you about the risks of assisted reproductive technology or IVF in general, but you will find a much more up-to-date, much more in-depth and um, constantly updated uh, version of this in the IVF consent forms that we have already given you or will be handing you. And we welcome any questions uh, after you've read the full version of this, but I will briefly outline some of the commonly asked uh, questions and try to answer them. So, in your consent forms, you will see that uh, beginning from the uh, uh, start of the process, that one of the adverse events that can happen is cycles can be canceled. Um, this happens usually in women over age 38, uh, those with low egg reserve, and five to 15% of the time, we may cancel the IVF stimulation for under response, but we do this only if we think that using a different regimen or different medication dosage that the patient will produce more eggs. Sometimes with mutual agreement, we will actually uh, still go after the few eggs. We'll try to fertilize them and we will um, discuss an embryo accumulation scheme with, uh, in these cases so that the couple can go through another IVF stimulation and accumulate embryos and finally transfer one normal embryo upon testing with PGS. We rarely 
have to cancel a cycle for over response of the ovaries because such patients are very uh, evident from uh, everything about their blood tests and appearance of their ovaries and we will appropriately adjust their dosage and start them on a lower dose and cancellation for an over response is rather rare. <clears throat> um, on the day of embryo, uh, on the day of egg retrieval, the partner may have problems producing a semen sample. That's one of the reasons we <clears throat> encourage a backup sperm to be frozen. <coughs> prior to that day, but um, uh, in such urgent cases, uh, we, will, we would um, have to discuss with the patient a uh, testicular sperm retrieval procedure um, on that day um, by us so that uh, we do not let the eggs um, go to waste or we don't have to freeze the eggs it's much more efficient if we can fertilize the eggs first uh, before subjecting to any freezing. Now, the most tangible risk of IVF process is probably the next one, the surgical risk of egg retrieval. Um, bleeding, infection, abscess formation, even death has been reported uh, due to such complications. But you will be taking prophylactic antibiotics you will have already taken prophylactic oral antibiotics before the procedure and um, the infectious risk of the procedure is uh, said to be 0.6 percent but in my experience it's been much lower than that uh, suffice it to say that we will take all the uh, asepsis and prophylactic antibiotic precautions to prevent this kind of complication from occurring Emergency surgery refers to times when uh, there is some intra-abdominal bleeding noted at the end of the procedure. Again, ex extremely rare. Um, never seen it being necessary in my experience. Anesthesia risks, you can imagine, um, are those such as reaction to various drugs from aspirin to complex anesthetic drugs. But we are fully equipped for um, CPR and you'll be under the care of uh, board certified anesthesia staff and um, in a facility that is uh, uh, equipped with uh, most common complications of anesthesia. Extremely rare condition to be um, concerned about but could certainly happen. We, this is one of the reasons we have a um, <clears throat> BMI or uh, limit of weight uh, um, for egg retrieval uh, procedures uh, because as you can imagine uh, heavier patients are harder to intubate if they were to stop breathing uh, during the uh, IV anesthesia procedure and that's why we observe a uh, weight limit or, or a BMI limit on our IVF candidates. So another unique um, complication of the IVF process is the hyperstimulation syndrome so, uh, caused, by, um, caused by the FSH injections. Now, only certain uh, types of patients are at risk for this, such as those with polycystic over syndrome, those who are under age 30 or having a low body mass index. And we recognize them and we treat them, but uh, sometimes pregnancy throws uh, such patients over the edge and they may uh, develop cysts in their ovaries, fluid accumulation in the abdomen, which can sometimes also happen in the lungs, and it can take severe or life-threatening uh, dimensions and uh, may require intensive care in the hospital. Again, extremely rare, uh, less than uh, 2% but probably much lower than that uh, with the current diligence we're showing to individualize and tailor the dose to different patient situations. Probably um, the most, uh, the uh, topic of most interest to a lot of you are, you know, is my pregnancy, 
going to be abnormal because I'm doing this in an artificial way? Are the miscarriage risks higher because, uh, again, this is a assisted technology? Uh, and uh, as I have discussed with most of you on your one-on-one -on -one visit, the chances of this working are, uh, in our current program, 80 to 90 percent in women under 35, and it gradually going down lower to 60s uh, in women up to age 38, and 40 to 50 in women up to 40, and further down um, in women over 40. But uh, in women over 35, the exact r rate of success is probably dependent on the individual's egg response and other clinical characteristics. So it's hard to look up at a table or a bar graph and try to read your success chances in our program. It's best discussed um, um, after evaluating your ovarian reserve uh, blood test results with you. The miscarriage risk is um, not any higher due to uh, uh, pregnancy being achieved by IVF. Uh, it's really a risk dependent on the age of the female, and uh, it's about 10-15% in women up to 35, and gradually increases um, until age 40, at which point it's 30-35%, and is higher in women over 40. Now, some of you may uh, be surprised to hear that ectopic pregnancy can still happen, but uh, even though we're bypassing the tubes, but it can happen in less than 1% due to apparent um, uh, drifting of the embryo in the endometrium into a fallopian tube or into a remnant of the fallopian tube, even though the fallopian tube may, be, may have been taken out in certain patients. So it can still happen, but much lower um, frequency than in natural conceptions in patients who are a candidate for IVF. Um, there's been a lot of controversy about the next two topics. Um, and suffice it to say that half of the existing studies show that there's an increased risk of birth defects uh, associated with IVF, but the other half do not show any associated risk of birth defects in the offspring uh, from IVF. And it is probably a reflection that IVF patients are a heterogeneous population of individuals. Some do carry medical risks, which will increase the risk of them having a baby with birth defects. And by helping them get pregnant, we are allowing such genetic traits to be transmitted to the next generation. This is what most of the studies are currently suggesting. Um, you will find a lot more continually updated information in your uh, consent forms about these types of studies. And um, the, delivery, the um, pregnancy from IVF is said to be somewhat more higher risk, even when you are looking at singleton pregnancies. Uh, the uh, newborns are a uh, few, several ounces smaller than naturally conceived babies, and um, the duration of the pregnancy is um, several days shorter uh, compared with natural conceptions on average. Uh, which means that some are quite premature than natural conceptions. Again, at this point, the jury is out whether this is due to uh, presence of individuals among IVF patients who carry risk factors for preterm delivery and uh, low birth weight babies. Uh, but suffice it to say that your obstetrician will be carefully monitoring you, your pregnancy, uh, uh, due to the um, treatment you've gone through. And uh, most IVF babies are healthy and most IVF pregnancies are uh, uneventful. And one obvious risk factor of IVF is multiple pregnancies. Uh, in general, we could say that 20 to 30% of the 
uh, deliveries from IVF are twins. Triplets are far fewer uh, than what they used to be. Currently, in our program, they're less than 1%, but uh, it can happen due to uh, mo monozygotic twinning or splitting of one embryo into two and creating such surprises. And um, multifetal pregnancy reduction means um, uh, reducing the pregnancy from triplets to twins or quadruplets to twins at 12 to 13 weeks to allow the remaining fetuses a better chance to make it to term or near term. Fortunately, in our program, multifetal pregnancy reduction is almost never had to be carried out. And um, it does carry a 5% chance of losing the entire pregnancy. Therefore, uh, we have adjusted our number of embryos to transfer to minimize uh, uh, the risk of getting into, get our patients into such situations where uh, such difficult decisions will have to be made. With that, I thank you for your attention, and I'm ready to take any questions, or you can bring them to your visit when you're one-on-one -on -one with your doctor.